amplified pattern recognition. Why does the universe exist? We're about five light sides away from the tiny Welcome to Think Tank. This is a podcast where in each episode we pick a topic and then we discuss it with industry professionals and thought leaders in that industry. I'm Josh Gonzalez. And I'm Braden Drew. And we're your hosts of Think Tank. This is episode 11 on social media and psychology. In this episode, we have two guests, Brent Sterling and Dr. Paul Burnett. Brent Sterling is a social media strategist for startups, non-for-profits, and the government. Dr. Paul Burnett is a psychology professor at Ryerson University, who also worked on digital avatars for psychology research. In this episode, we talk about social media and how it relates to psychology and human behavior, our society, businesses, and emerging technologies like bots, AR and VR, and gaming. We also talk a lot about digital avatars and the way that we interact with these technologies to communicate with other people. We bring up a lot of ideas, processes, and philosophies in this episode, so let's just get right into it. Before we get started, Brent, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you what you do in the industry and uh, kind of where you're going in your, uh, in your career path right now. So currently, I'm the social media marketer at the, the DMZ at Ryerson University. It's a tech incubator. So I run all the social media there. And then I advise the tech startups that exist in the space. They're about give or take 60 or 70 at any given time on their social media strategy. And then when I'm not doing that, I uh, run my own social media marketing agency. So I've done work with like not-for-profits, government, startups. Uh, I did the international Tat- uh, Toronto tattoo convention one time. So like it's kind of all the things social. Yeah, it's a new marketing platform, right? Using all of these. Uh, yeah, socials. you can't just, and very rarely is somebody just a social media person because you never, even if you look at jobs now where social media is becoming more of a thing, it's uh, it's still like social media and PR or social media and graphic design or any of those things. Nice. And Paul, I mean, I know obviously you're my uh, you're my psychology prof right now, teaching me uh, personality and behavior, which is amazing. You did the last week on kind of what you've done in your research, and I just explain what you did with that because it was absolutely phenomenal. Okay, so basically, I take it from completely academic point of view. Um, so the work is mostly done on artificial personality. So looking at part of the research fellowship that I did in Queen's University in Belfast was working on something called Social Signals Processing Network, but it was part of a larger group. And what I had access to were these lovely pretend people. So they are computer avatars that were completely built by a huge collection of different people from different industries. So people from engineering, uh, psych, linguistics, um, computer sciences, and they created characters. So the platform actually has four different characters who have distinct personalities. So one's really aggressive, one's really pessimistic and depressed, kind of. There's one that's really perky, cheerful, and then there's one that's sensible, lightheaded. And then people can actually have conversations with these characters. And it's built up to the point where behind the scenes is basically non-existent. So you don't actually have to do anything as the researcher. You you just set up the system and they can have a conversation with it. And the system is capable of maintaining that conversation. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. And again, I mean, like we always talk about virtual reality on this podcast. We had a couple episodes. I think that's more than a few. Yeah, yeah. We had a we had quite a few. We uh, first I would say what six, seven episodes is all like virtual reality. And I think that's like really cool how um, like these virtual avatars are completely coded and you can actually have conversations with them. And I'm really interested in how that can play a role in social media where like Brent, like right now, like that's what you do almost like you're that you're that personality for mm-hmm. a company almost. And you're speaking on behalf of the company as almost their personality. Like, how do you actually do that? How do you like take the personality of that business or that organization and then like speak to other people because that's literally what you do if they tweet at you if they facebook message you you have to like talk to them yeah uh in the worst way to describe it it's like multiple personality disorder (laughs) um where you know like each brand even right now i have three or four different accounts that i'm monitoring so each of them has their own different brand personality and they all kind of react in different ways from a, a tech incubator standpoint that's 
part of a university, you're not going to say the same things as you would if you're running like a, a pub or a restaurant. Really, to be successful at social anyway, you have to have personality within it. So personality is a, a huge asset and, and a huge tool in, in social media. Also makes it seem like it's <clears throat> more human. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. I mean, if you wouldn't say it out loud, don't tweet it. I mean, and obviously you're going to censor yourself a little bit, and that's what everybody does through social. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll talk about more about that. Later yeah, for I sure. mean, but at the same time, so many people flip into this like I'm a marketing machine when they're pushing from a brand, and that's why a lot of people aren't very good at social. They're just like I don't understand how anybody ever gets anything out of it. And it's because they immediately like flip in their mind to like, I am a brand now, so I should sound like a robot. I think that there is this shift to, uh, I always say it's not like B2B or B2C, it's P2P because everybody's looking to deal with another person. They're not looking to deal with a brand. They want to deal with the person behind that right. brand. And that's the first thing I thought when you did that lecture, Paul. That yeah, that's amazing. actually yeah. why these kind of things are being developed mm -hmm. academically is because the idea of how we interact with computers is very unnatural. Uh, typing is not a natural thing. It's very artificial, very created. And to make them more and more human-like is to make it more and more natural. So yeah. putting in that personality for in, in any different kind of situations, whether it's commercial or academic or cultural in museums, et cetera. That's part of the goal behind a lot of this academic research mm. is to make it human. I actually had a discussion with a like developer buddy of mine last night, and we were talking about like the rise of bots because Facebook just came out with their like whole, whole platform, messenger bots, platform yeah. and everything, right? And like that's really what it comes, He he's a dev, so he knows far more than I do. Uh, but and he was talking about the ability to essentially craft all like customer service and everything into a bot. Like at this point, yeah, you can buy things through bots, but having that conversation that sounds personable is that next level. That's kind of where it's all going to go. Eventually they'll phase me out and I won't have to exist anymore and it you'll just be tweeting with bots. What's interesting from our perspective, the psychological perspective, is that we find it really interesting how people buy into it. They're willing to buy into these characters. And despite the fact that really logically you know that it's just an artificial character, it's not a real person, people are willing to buy into it and provide it a theory of mind, basically. Give it a personality, give it a backstory. So in those conversations, we've had people flirting with the characters. We've had people think that the characters all live together and hang out afterwards. So they, they're willing to totally buy into it, which is, is really interesting. It is because really interesting. You, you would think that logically you'd be like, well, why am I? And some people don't. It really depends on people's personality. Some people are very shut down to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But most people are really willing to just buy into it. Yeah, I've even had people come up to me, uh, especially with the DMZ, but with other accounts that I've done as well, where I end up, I say like, yeah, I'm the social media person for this brand. And they go, oh, I never really thought about the fact that there was even a person behind that, as if it's just something that's like you tweeted a brand and and then just magically appears like, back to you there's like in a, their personality. Yeah, there's yeah. like that responds. To yeah, you. yeah, like magical Coca Cola man just like yeah. types back to you. Like that's a person that you're dealing with on the other end. It's and crazy. I mean, the internet gets harsh because of that. Yeah, uh, like people like to troll. So I wonder if like that's what social media is just going to become. I mean, like Facebook. Yeah, they bought Oculus. Facebook wants to make augmented reality, virtual reality, like the way to communicate with people. So I'm wondering if that's just going to be the way you interact with brands. They'll just like, here's our person. Like literally make a human being like person. Talk to this person, but then it's just multiplied for everybody. And I'd be so, I, I think that's just a weird idea. But do you think like people would interact that, with that better than like they do with Twitter and Facebook yeah. now? Yeah. yeah. People are going to buy into it. And the other thing you have to think about with all technology is basically for everyone that thinks of it as being weird, you get phased out, you die it's off. It's true, yeah. So you're replaced by younger people who are used to it, and to them it's completely normal. I went to school, in high school, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have Twitter and all that. So it's when it was introduced, my generation's like, oh, I guess we'll try this out. Where younger people, it's just what they know. It's just natural yeah. for them, yeah. So the older people die out, and then the people who are left are the people who are used to it. Yeah, yeah. it's a adapt or die. I mean, even if you look at like video games, just hop on like Xbox Live, 
and you're dealing with real people, but it's through the internet. So all of a sudden, an 11 year old is smack talking you all over the show because they have a mask on. Because they, and they're like a huge like Call of Duty like because you're you're war you hero. know they're unhappy dust six seven four eight nine and you're like <laughs> okay well how am I gonna how am I how do you ever know who that person is or, or if it is a real person I yeah, wonder if that's gonna the happen. Issue, the issue yeah. is not whether the person you're talking to is real or not. The issue is how much anonymity you have. So that's the big issue with the internet is that we've introduced a medium of communication that you can actually have a lot of anonymity. And for some people, that is actually really beneficial. So people who struggle face-to-face with social interactions, people who are extremely shy, et cetera, they actually come alive online and they actually engage more online. They can self-disclose more online. But at the same time, it also opens the window for I can be ruder than I normally am. I can, that politeness factor is gone. Um, and it's the anonymity. It doesn't matter who's on the receiving end. It's how much anonymity. So if their image is there or if they're on video, that anonymity is reduced and they're going to be more polite. So it depends on the level of anonymity, not who they're talking to. I, I find it really – what's interesting because I get a lot of trolls. Uh, Facebook, because they've kind of introduced this whole like Facebook is your online passport and you have to be like this – a a legitimate human with a legitimate name and you can only change your name so many times. I find that people still think that they're anonymous on Facebook and that gets into some crazy stuff. When I was doing uh, work with a couple of uh, candidates for the election, this past election in 2015, you wouldn't believe the stuff that people would write on a candidate's Facebook wall that's insanity and then you can i can click to your name and your entire because generally they're not smart so their entire facebook is open and it's public and now i have pictures of your kids and now i can find your twitter account and now i can find your website and oh you've registered a website and it's a .ca now i can find your address your phone number all those things that's like readily accessible but i think that people get lost in this idea that like i'm on the internet so i'm anonymous but if if anybody is half decent at Google, they can find out everything about you from one. And I don't need, I don't need to like find your password or any of that stuff. All I need is like your Facebook profile. What have you linked it to? What's written there? Who are you friends with? Now I'm talking. Now I add your wife on Facebook, and I can talk to her and say whatever I want. Like I mean, like obviously I'm not. And stuff. Obviously yeah, I'm yeah. not doing that. Yeah, but, like, but, but you can. Are, yeah. There are some major consequences on what you do online. People have lost jobs because of yeah. it because they don't think of that. You don't have that anonymity that you think you do, and it can have lots of consequences. People don't realize how the the large scale that that social can have as an impact on everything that you're doing. I was just interviewing for student staff and I didn't interview one because of what he had tweeted. Like, because it's an extension of themselves. It is them. It's the things they write, the things they post. It is them. Yeah. But there are so many people that just don't take that into account. Anything that you post on the internet can come back to haunt you at some point. And I think that's not really said enough. So you think in the younger generations, it's going to be more integrated into their uh, education? I, I, I don't think it's going to end up being a school thing. It's going to be a parenting thing. And it comes down to it. A lot of people try to pass off parenting to schools and say, school should teach this. No, parents should teach that. And parents are the ones who have to teach their kids how to be responsible and safe in the world. And that includes the cyber world. So, yeah, it's a, to me, it's a parenting issue, not a school issue. But still an education issue just from the parents. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, yeah but yeah. education, the parents are your primary educators. Exactly. As much as you want to try to ignore that. Yeah. And some parents are like, well, aren't you teaching my kids that? No, you should be doing that. Oh, and on You're, that note, like you see you see parents giving their like seven year olds their iPhone and their iPads. And it's like, do they even have the ability to comprehend what you're telling them? Like, oh, you shouldn't be taking pictures of yourself and posting it on Instagram because, like, my baby cousin does that all the time. Mm. They don't even know what it means. So uh, my wife is pregnant right now, so we're actually having these discussions about our child. Um, so uh, I think that, one, when you're younger, you don't get it. And, like, kids just won't. Um, and I've definitely had to have conversations with my niece about what she was posting on Instagram. And as far as the digital learning side goes, that's kind of an interesting one because, okay, so you grow up there. Are, I have a bunch of friends that have kids. 
some of them don't let their kids watch television until they're like two. And there are, I'm sure Paul can speak to this way better than I can. There are things that have been proven to like, you know, don't show your kids screens for a little while because it can mess with their like 3D uh, visual perceptions or something along those lines. Um, Paul will weigh in on that in a sec. Uh, <laughs> and and then the other side to it, it though is that we are surrounded in screens and how do you access like h- how do you live in a world where there are screens everywhere i mean i just spent my entire day staring at a computer or a-, a phone so i mean if you don't learn to interact with those screens and to kind of teach yourself how to do that in moderation uh so that and i don't know the answer to that yet because my Child is still unborn. And I'm going to let, yeah. I'm gonna let Paul wait, say wait, wait, The problem we have in terms of the research side is we can't keep up. So technology is faster than research. So we can't keep up with it. And it's our goal is to try to stay as close as we can, but we can't keep up. The technology comes out and we try to see, okay, what kind of effect will this have? But by the time we've done enough proper research to do that, the technology is completely different. So it's actually really difficult from the research perspective. So any of that kind of information you get, just keep in mind it's a couple years. Yeah. So behind. like right now you have, you know, like what Facebook was doing to people yeah. in what, two thousand ten, two thousand eight? What, 2008? what yeah. are we how far uh, it it varies depending yeah. on how fast researchers are at publishing. But that's why when I've reviewed papers before where somebody refers to Facebook and I'm like, you need to tell me in this paper what year you were looking yeah. at Facebook. Yeah, that's so you know what's going on. It's interesting and in how like the media ends up portraying that too, because they never really talk about like they always say this study just came out and it's about Facebook and here are the findings, but they never say it's like oh, it's never Facebook two thousand eight, yeah. right? Yeah, they just say difference. this is what Facebook does to you, and you're like, but which Facebook? Which yeah. one? Yeah, you, it's never going to be the most current version. It can't be. You have to do the research, and that takes time. Then you have to analyze, write it up, publish, and the publishing process can take time. So you're at least a year back. So do you think it's up to the companies then to do this kind of research, like before nope. they actually put out? No, you don't think they should. No, have because to? the problem is um, companies are biased. Right. So they're only going to report Legit. research that supports their company. They're not going to be able to. And that's why anytime you do research and if you're affiliated with any kind of company, you have to disclose that when you're publishing. Right. Um, because it's a conflict of interest. So it has to be outside people to do it. Yeah, because yeah. any of the big tech companies are going to never come out and say, well, yeah. we are, our products had a negative impact on yeah, students and children. Happen. Like that, nobody's ever going to say that. The <laughs> other thing to keep in mind is none of these products are by nature good or bad. It depends on how other people use it. Mm-hmm. So there's always going to be a good way to use a technology and a bad way of using technology. Right. So it's, yeah. by nature, yeah. they're not good or bad. There was an article uh, just recently, and I tweeted it out and got an argument or something. A high-level person at a bank uh, tweeted a (laughs) thing about how Twitter was terrible for, like, teens and da-da-da-da-da. I came back and said, when are we going to stop blaming Twitter and start blaming actual people on how they're using it? Like, because that's really what it comes down to, is, like, you can build a really amazing tool that could change the human race i'm doing i'm putting air silicon quotes valley out. Mantra, <laughs> um, but yeah. and the whole point is like people will try and ruin it yeah. um, and these kind of arguments are not new to internet like when television first came out it was television's bad television is good it's the same kind of arguments anytime any kind of new tech comes out it's not just related to internet and it's not good or bad it's how we use it i think yeah the the headline though sells way better right yeah. like twitter's oh, yeah. ruining lives opposed to like humans are ruining other humans lives yeah. Yeah. ironically yeah. they do that so they can get more retweets yeah no, which is hilarious. i know, I know right? <laughs> right so, so if this somebody, is gonna go viral on twitter <laughs> so as somebody who's seeing these tweets from these people bashing like twitter or a certain company or product like how do you sift through the biases or like them skewing? Do you just have to always be like on your toes like, oh, this is the internet, that may or may not be true? Anything that says something is completely one extreme is wrong. You could just automatically assume that. Anything that says inter- Twitter's completely bad is wrong. Anybody that says Twitter's completely good is wrong. Yeah. If it's they're showing a balanced view, then you can take what they're saying with more validity anything that's extreme 
just ignore it. I think you take it to an interesting point, though, in like, why do people share that? I mean, for me, I've kind of like broken it down into like a bunch of different ways of why people share, right? But I think it has more, and again, Paul is going to be able to speak to this way more than I will be able to, but I think people share stuff based on how they want to be seen or how they, like, either that they're knowledgeable or that they identify with something or, and they want other people to identify them as identifying with that. And to that end, you get people that will just retweet things without actually reading the article or share something on Facebook without actually looking into it because they're just like, well, this is how I want to be perceived by my friends, by my followers, by whatever that may be. And it's so easy to just hit share. Just yeah, and you're just like, now there. I've done, so- I mean, slacktivism, yeah. but literally, like, yeah. now I've done something, right? And th- now people will perceive me in a different way, which is com- completely true in that people will perceive you based off of the stuff that you share. Um, I th- think it's, yeah. Paul probably has yeah. a lot to say. So yeah, part Go, of it Paul. is definitely <laughs> that we have, I'm, I'm not going to get into psych, um, like personality theories, but we have different personas that we want to get across. Um, and that's been around for thousands of years kind of thing, how we want to be seen. So we do use the internet to extend that even further. So we have now like a, basically a global persona of how we want to be seen. Um, in terms of sharing, though, it's not simply how they want to be seen. Some of it is simply they go with confirmation bias. They see something that supports an idea that they have. Therefore, even if it's a completely stupid article with no science behind it, they go, oh, I actually thought that too. Share, look, this supports what I thought. So part of the sharing is actually based on sharing stupid stuff because it confirms what they th- they think is true. So is there any, this is a selfish question, uh, mm-hmm. is there any like formula that you would say that if you if you had specific ingredients into a social media post, see how selfish it is. Uh, <laughs> no, this is perfect. This right? Is, this is perfect. If, if you had any kind of specific ingredients that a, that a social media post should possess, what are those from like a, a psychological standpoint? Like, say I want I want to put something out and I want it shared a million times. Is, is there a way that you could actually assess something and go, okay, this would go viral or more viral than, than this would? Is there is there like a, a standard to that? Or could you assess it, I guess, is my question? Um, no. <laughs> uh, so the short answer is no. <laughs> so I don't know of any Come research. On, Paul, that, man, hook me up. I don't know of any research that can do that. I think my hypothesis would be that it has to be extremes. So anything that's middle of the road, people aren't going to be interested in. Mm-hmm. So anything that's an extreme position, because then people are going to either react to it of like, yeah, I really like that, or wow, that's really stupid. But yeah. either way, you're going to get a reaction. So like Donald Trump quotes. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. That's how he went viral. Right. You know? Yeah, no, it yeah, really so it's is. Because it's yeah. either people that really yeah, agree with it or people that really, really hate him. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Empty can and, makes and the loudest noise. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. there's also the aspect of if you have a celebrity attached to something, it more likely to go viral yeah like if kim kardashian says something unfortunately it's more likely to go viral even yeah exactly. it doesn't matter then if we says. say it right now you're telling me that this podcast isn't going to go as viral as kim kardashian not unless we have her involved somehow <laughs> we'll tag kim yeah. kardashian yeah, we right. actually have to you know? we have like a uh, show notes on each episode now. <laughs> yeah so right. we mentioned her i'm allowed to do that. if you just tag it and then they'll find us somehow kim kardashian okay this podcast talked about her i think so yeah from a branding point of view kim since we're talking about kim kardashian she came up she has her own brand and image and a lo- and i think she's tailing on what you said about extremes some people really love them the Kardashians, other people hate them. And is that why she gets so much traffic and, and so like people are always talking about, oh, what is she doing? What is she going to do next? Like, it, like I'm trying to think, like, is she really that extreme or is she just doing it so she can have this, this cyber persona to be able to have a, a million tweets and refollowers or is she actually like that? I think it's more the cult of celebrity than anything else. Nobody knows what Kim Kardashian is really like. I think I think what I was trying to get is that like the status quo now. If if you don't go to extremes, then in the cyberspace you won't have a voice and won't have that huge viral following. Because like 
I'm going to just throw a name out there. Like, I really like Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I think he's an amazing speaker, and everything he says is usually really awe-inspiring and is awesome. But he can tweet something out that will, like, like blow the hinges off your mind, and you're like, oh, my God. But he won't have as big as a following just because he isn't always tailoring to an extreme. So is that necessarily a negative use case for the social media or like is, like people don't really talk about that like the, <laughs> the loudest voice gets heard. It's like a double-edged sword though because in like he's not an extreme but then you can also say that because it's somewhere in the middle it's probably more valid but then because it's more valid it's not going to go more viral. It's oh, really yeah, strange. It, it's unfortunately the way that our society is set up is that we're not geared towards the most valid reason or geared towards the more showy um, and the Kardashians know how to do that better than anyone else really and then they paired up with Kanye which is someone else who really knows how to play the, the system and it's weird it's like e- is it even them or do they have people like Brent doing this for them I don't think they tweet or that much I don't know I mean I don't I think I can't say that I think I think Kanye doesn't have people no, yeah, I don't think Based he would ever let any Twitter rants. I'm gonna go no. <laughs> um, like going back to the Neil deGrasse Tyson thing, I mean, what I always advise people, and even when I'm building a social media strategy, it comes down to like three major things: um, it's your goals, your target segments, and your content themes. But basically, everything that you put out has to relate back to your target segment and achieve one of your goals. And one of your goals can just be like, I want to be a thought leader in X. And really though, what that comes down to is like providing value through your content themes. Really, that's what I think. And, you know, the the difference is that Kim Kardashian can provide value to a larger target segment audience, right? Like because she's on television and she has all of these other channels, whereas if you're just on the internet, like as much as the internet has kind of decentralized what pop culture is, pop culture still exists and it still holds a significant amount of relevance. There are just different streams now. I mean, even like PewDiePie and things like that are like very niche to a specific community, but that community is gigantic. So it depends though how large your target segment market is. I mean, if Neil deGrasse Tyson is talking about space, Think about all the people that like Kim Kardashian. Some people like Kim Kardashian because she's trashy, or some people think she's a train wreck, but they can't look away. Whereas not everybody's super into space, right? Like she has more mass appeal than Neil deGrasse Tyson. As much as like we can sit here and be like, yeah, well, we obviously like him more. That's not the case for everybody. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why Donald Trump is so popular is because he did the celebrity thing first. He didn't do politician first. He did celebrity first. So he became a celebrity, became well-known. Therefore, people are more interested in his campaign compared to some random governor from wherever. And he's known internationally as well. Yeah, it's crazy because they're probably just thinking in your head, you're fired. And you're like, yeah, they just know his thing, right? Yeah, but that's – it's more – it's not about – and not – it's just like not everybody is doing research. They're not – Right. You know, it depends on – I think a, a number of things th- that I'm not going to talk about because Paul's here. Uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> like, you know, like, you're, yeah, you know better than I do. Uh, You'll like, just you chime know, in and validate. Even, yeah, or, even like, like your, yeah. your educational background and yeah. all of those things are going to have an impact on how you view the world and what you enjoy. And it's the same reason that, like, tons of people like NASCAR and I hate NASCAR and I'm not saying anything about the educational background of people that like NASCAR don't get me wrong what I am saying is like dependent on a number of factors you end up liking certain things and you end up disliking other things there are a number of people that like what Donald Trump has to say and so, that, that's a scarier for me that's a scarier question of like American culture at large I know, I'm gonna say yeah that, distraction that, of the masses that's, that whole that's idea. scary the yeah, general scary. the mass of, of the population then like Kim Kardashian and Toronto Dump Toronto Dump <laughs> Tron- no, no, hey, Toronto Dump, dump. Yeah, yeah, Toronto Dump, dump. <laughs> That's the Donald name. Trump. <laughs> Tronal dump just makes more sense. Though. It does. So is that, dump is that scary? Then can you look at those social trends where like the extremes are being highlighted and people are liking it as like a general consensus of what people are actually supporting? Like if I, I look at not. if I look at his Twitter, and I'm like, oh my god! Whenever he says something, he explodes, and all these people retweet him stuff, and people who actually like him, then 
Like that's that's terrifying. I I think that it showcases the different personalities that exist in the world, right? I mean, you're never going to have like just an entire group of people that have the exact same idea. Even the craziest stuff that still like you know, racism or like Nazis or any of that stuff, like that still exists. There are still Nazis that exist. And that, I mean, to the average person is insanity. But, like, to the group of Nazis, that's totally normal. It's their way of life. It's weird. Well, and yeah, to them, we are the weird ones. They're like, how can you not be thinking like us? Yeah. This goes back to what Paul said earlier about, you know, you can build a tool, but it's all in how people use it. So, I mean... The positive to the internet is that it's connected all these communities that had no one before, right? In a in a positive light, like you're introverted and you're in high school and you're the only person in your high school that likes anime or whatever. Uh, Even then- more extreme than that is you have cases where people from LGBT communities, mm-hmm. if you're in a really yeah, totally. small community and you don't know another gay person, yeah, that's you can a find way people. Example than you anime. can find those people yeah. online. So yeah. one of the major advantages to the internet in terms of psychological well-being is you can find that social mm-hmm. support. And even for things even less extreme than that, like my sister, when she was pregnant, had a, this pregnancy app. So she was in contact with all these other women who mm-hmm. were pregnant and do it around the same time. And even now that the babies are all born, they check in and like sleep patterns and stuff. Yeah. So even though she knows people in real life that have children, none of them were having kids at the same time. Mm-hmm. So they could share their stories and support that way. So there is a lot of that support that you can get from this global community yeah. that you might not get in Europe, yeah, why especially if you're in a small yeah. area. And on the flip side of yeah. that, you just replace LGBT or like pregnant women with anything yeah. to, the, to the flip side. Yeah. And those exist too. Yeah. So, I mean, it is that, like, give and take kind of space where yeah. you can't necessarily say, like, the Internet is good or bad for anything because no, it all depends just, on how it's, it's, it's being used. It's simply another medium of communication. Right. And then how do you expose someone who's about to have a child? How do you, it's, you have to put your own settings and boundaries as yeah. a parent on that technology? And then when do you say, like, all right – Time to let you fly. It's, you're open to the internet now. Whatever comes into your space is whatever's going to be there, and you're going to have to just deal with it. Yeah. Okay. I'll take That's it. true. Yeah. Right? So true, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, in addition to personality, <laughs> yeah, I on. teach child development. So that's the other area that I focus in is uh, development. Um, so, in terms of when should you, it's going to be individual to every child. So, the idea of putting time frames that are for everyone is not going to work. Um, Because every kid's going to be different and some will have a much better social understanding than others and they progress at different rates cognitively and all that kind of stuff. So every parent's going to have to, and not every parent will, but every parent should judge their child and be like, okay, this kid is ready for this aspect. This kid is not ready for a cell phone. This kid is ready for this. And they're going to have to judge it individually. And even within, if you have multiple children, you got to think of your kids differently and is this kid ready for this is this kid ready for this so it's going to be up to the parent to think of it individually what would you say to uh potential parents about uh how to stay current on everything that's out there i mean uh development process well i mean okay think about it this way right instagram didn't exist like facebook existed far before instagram so your kid comes to you you know what facebook is and they say, I want to download Instagram. You don't know what that is. And you're like, cool. Uh, That's the thing. You don't say cool. <laughs> you look into it. <laughs> yeah. Because even, so yeah. this will make Paul's me Paul's parenting seem tips old. here. I don't, don't say cool. I, I don't don't say to, cool. Don't ever say cool. So I don't even <laughs> consider myself that old, but I'm in my mid-30s. I don't have Instagram. I don't have Snapchat. Mm-hmm. I don't have all those cool kid things. Mm-hmm. I have the old people stuff of Facebook. Yeah. And Twitter somewhat. Um, so... In terms of that, I would have to be like, well, I don't know what this new whatever is coming up next kind of thing is. So as a parent, look into it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's your responsibility. It's like any other aspect of parenting. If you don't know about it and your kid brings it up, 
don't, yeah. don't act don't like say cool. Yeah, but don't say cool. Yeah. Don't pretend like you know when you don't. Yeah, look and into it and look into it hard. with them. Yeah, and that's yeah. harder to look into because, like, with video games, like, there's a rating on it. This mm. game's rated M, and I see a gun on here. Maybe you shouldn't. Oh, Twitter! It's just a bird. Cool. Oh, wait. Yeah. There's a KKK yeah, member no, exactly. tweeting at you. Well, now? the most like, important thing for parents is for any of those kind of programs, if programs, whatever you want to call them, apps, programs, uh, apps yeah, um, <laughs> is for the parents to think. Okay, what are the privacy settings of that? So, yeah. like you mentioned with your niece, is that the parents should be talking right away before anything's downloaded. Look into what is that privacy? How much control can the parent yeah. have? And like, just stay. I mean, I'm lucky in that my job forces me to stay on top of every single social media channel. So I have all the Snapchats and all the Instagrams. you got to write a book for parents. Oh, yeah. As it goes. You have to. <laughs> yeah, but that's the whole thing is that if you write a book on social media right now, it's just time, time it gets published. It's it's, what it's, about a blog, maybe? I yeah, like right? Bad. Just And then <laughs> <laughs> write yeah, a blog. So, so like true, you can yeah. only read the last two months, and everything <laughs> before that is garbage. Like, Snapchat <laughs> for blogs, man. They just delete after six oh months. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Maybe that's where the internet's heading. People don't want it to stick around, so it's going to start deleting. I mean, like, that was a whole new idea, right? Snapchat was a brand new idea. People are like, wait, you send a photo and it deletes after 10 seconds? That's strange. Yeah, which is, I mean, but it's literally what people used to do. Like, if, I mean, even in high school, we used to get, like, the, the, disposable cameras, and then we'd have to go and get, like, the photos developed, and then, like, look at them, and half of them are blurry and terrible. And if you ever lost one of those photos, it is gone. I mean, that's how society existed forever. I mean, the idea of uh, kind of, like, capturing a moment was so rare anyway. Uh, and now it's the idea that we capture everything. I mean, you experience every single aspect of your life looking through your cell phone screen so that you can record it. Even as a child, I mean, I got to play Nintendo for max an hour a day. And then like that was all my TV time. And now it's it's kind of the opposite and of that. Yeah. The problem with that, though, is that that's why we have higher obesity rates in children and stuff, because mm -hmm. they're spending their entire summers in front of a tablet. So what we're yeah. saying is our childhood was better. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, was there healthier. Any <laughs> healthier. <laughs> yeah. Have you found any links to uh, anxiety with this? Because, again, like you said, people are itching for it. People are itching for it. And, like, I don't know. I've noticed with, like, a lot of people around me and, like, on the Internet and stuff, just, like, anxiety I find is, like, just, like, rising. I don't know if that's, like, a kind of correlation between that and social media, like, being constantly connected. Like, have you found anything anxiety provoking? I, I don't think there's any. I, I don't know of any research on it. Um, I Personally, I don't think it does because um, on the flip side, you also – a lot of people use it to actually decrease their anxiety So as a source of support. So even probably quite applicable to the people who might be listening to this is there's research on what's referred to as first-year adjustment. So when students start at universities and colleges, that first year is kind of rough – and people have a hard time adapting, switching from the high school setting, leaving home, all that kind of thing. And there's a study that shows that people who have Facebook and who are communicating with friends and family through Facebook actually have an easier time adjusting. So a lot of it can actually, you can use it to actually reduce anxiety. Yeah. I, Interesting. I lived in Japan for four years uh, and I... Used, and it was like 2006 to 2010, so that was like right around the time when like Facebook was starting to kick off. So I used Facebook all the time uh, to just keep in touch and slash to make my friends jealous because I lived in Japan and they still lived in Canada. Snapchat would come in handy. Right? That's yeah. I keep thinking about it now. I have some like, friends who are in Japan, I would have actually. such – like I used to have to take photos with a digital camera. Like I, I bought a digital camera to go to Japan – and then I'd have to like take them off and then put the From camera the card, SD card into yeah, my yeah. yeah. I and still do that. I, yeah, <laughs> right. But that's I mean, and now it's just so instant. Like I mean, oh, for a time okay. you could only upload I think it was like sixty photos to a Facebook album. Yeah, yeah. So you had to if like on mine if you go back, it's like Thailand part one, Thailand part two, yeah, Thailand part three, yeah, and which is. You know, nuts, because now it's just like you could take 4,000 photos right now, rapid fire, and then upload them all 
in a Facebook album from your phone in like um, two minutes. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's just crazy uh, <laughs> to think like how quickly it's gonna like evolve because like technology is only going quicker. It's like now what's gonna happen? Are we gonna actually be able to upload full on memories? Like you know, I think that's what Facebook wants yeah. to do. That's what Zuckerberg is no, talking new about. Facebook doing. is gonna be like VR. Yeah, you're just gonna like put a headset on. It's gonna be like this, like this yeah. room, and you can just sit down with anybody that you want. I'm more interested in how Facebook does ads at that point. You It'll know, be in the the background or like, yeah, yeah, yeah like that's like what I'm wondering. We'll each see different ones. We'll each see like a different thing. Like every time I look over here, it'll be like something just for me. That's what ads I wonder is like, you. how does that look from one the user experience as far as how do you experience ads, and two, how do I buy those ads, and how do you engage with them? Like, how do you click through? How do you and buy truck something? Truck eye gazing. Oh, Brent looked at this ad. And like, like do I get? Seconds. Do I get? So now I have to pay because you looked at it for a second. But like, what do I pay if you action on it? Can oh. you purchase things through that? Like all of the like social selling tools. There's the other side to it where you can look at it from a brand perspective and like create an actual experience in VR for people to yeah. experience, and then they go, oh, I want to do this. But, like, how do you kind of jump in on that organic Facebook in a, in a VR setting? How does oh. advertising kind maybe, of work in that? Maybe right? we go full circle here and go back to what Paul was talking about in his research where, like, you just engage with, like, a virtual person that is a brand ambassador. A virtual brand. Oh, almost like a, an person. entity sitting here. Or like, it is a world. Like, you go into, like, Facebook land on, on VR. Yeah, no, but and before inside you get there. It's just, yeah, and it's they like, walk yeah. you into virtual Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Shopping. Yeah, totally. and it's like, it, but it would be like YouTube pre-roll ads. Yeah. Where it's like, before you enter Facebook world, you have to talk to this Amazon brand ambassador for yeah. 30 seconds. Where you're like, no, I just, I already have this. Can we just move this along? And they're being really <laughs> nice to you because they've been programmed that way. Yeah. Let the trolls begin. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Oh, for sure. Well, yeah, that's a great way to end this off. Uh, guys, thanks so much. Brent, Paul, thanks so much for being on Think Tank. No problem. We'll uh, definitely great. have to do this again. Yeah. yeah. I if you enjoyed this talk and want to check out more, go to our website at thinktankcast.com and subscribe with your email so we can send you all of the latest episodes, news, and updates right to your inbox. Also, on our website, there will be show notes for this episode, uh, some links to the things that we talked about, and more detailed information on our guests. If you want to see the video of this episode, it'll be on our YouTube channel, which is also linked on our website. And if you want to keep in touch, we're on social media. Check us out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're at Think Tank Cast on pretty much everything, so you can find us on the web. And all of these details, again, will be linked to our website at thinktankcast.com. Hope to hear from you guys soon. Amplified pattern recognition. Why right. does the universe exist? Yeah. 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 We're about five yeah. lives yeah. away from yeah. 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 yeah.